Creepypasta are the cornerstone of internet horror. It sounds like a joke, but I mean that genuinely. Think about all the games, web series, and online mysteries that were based off or around concepts first popularized by Creepypasta. Even now, Creepypasta remakes are very popular on YouTube, and the search for the original Jeff image is one of the largest mysteries of this year. At least, in the very niche corner of the internet that actually cares about this type of thing. By the way, I know you're pretty surprised. It didn't take me six months to upload this time. It was only, uh, eight. Oh. Well, at this rate, I should be at 100k in about two to three more years. So, that's good. Anyway, let's get into these creepypasta that scared me when I was younger. And, uh, follow my social media on the link below. Oh, and by the way, as always, thank you for the support, everyone. I'm so inconsistent, and yet you guys still always show up. I don't know why, but that's not for me to worry about. Let's go. This first one is probably the most obscure of all the ones on this list by far, so I wouldn't be surprised if nobody here actually knows this one yet. Stairs. The way I stumbled upon this one was actually because of a channel called Hodo Hoodlum's Revenge. Imagine it. The year is 2014. Happy by Pharrell Williams is literally inescapable, and in a specific niche corner of YouTube, creepypasta are all the rage. This was also the year that Scare Theater started dropping bangers, but that's another story for another day. Anyway, way back then, I saw this video in my recommended and checked it out. Out of all the stories mentioned in the video, only one stands out to me to this day. That story is... the one that I already mentioned. Yeah, I don't know exactly where I was going with that, but let's just get into the story. Actually, this story has a reading time of two minutes, so just sit down, everyone. Let me put on some better music. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. All right, everyone, gather around the fire and listen up. <clears throat> In 1984, there lived an old widowed lady by herself in a two-story house who was completely immobile and bound to her wheelchair. Ever since the mysterious death of her husband, she required the aid of a carer who would visit her daily to help her with everyday tasks. What made it even more difficult was the fact that the two floors of the house were only connected by an old staircase inside. When the old lady needed to move between the two, the carer would have to carry her frail body like an infant up and down the stairs. One day the police received a call from the widow. There had been a murder. Since police units were scarce at the time and the murderer had already fled the scene, only one detective was sent out to conduct the initial crime scene report. He arrived to see the carrier's body splayed out on the floor with her vocal cords ripped out in a pool of blood on the first level of the house, with the old lady atop the staircase in her wheelchair watching him, still and silently, seemingly in shock. He could immediately rule her out as a suspect due to her inability to move up and down the stairs and because she was trapped up there the entire time the murder took place. It was similar to the death of her husband many years ago who had suffocated in his sleep on the couch downstairs. The detective put on his gloves, took photos, swapped for evidence, and covered the body until the coroner arrived later. All routine business. He scoped the house downstairs for any clues, and then asked the old lady if he could look upstairs. She insisted that she was upstairs the entire time, and no one apart from her had been up there that day, but regardless of this, the detective ascended the staircase to which she hesitantly moved aside. Beyond the staircase, there was a narrow corridor with three closed doors along it. He checked behind each of the doors. The empty bedroom, nothing. The bathroom, nothing. He became anxious as he slowly made his way to the final bedroom where the old lady slept. He opened it and everything looked normal. A bed, a wardrobe, and a bedside table with a lamp. He checked every wall of the room in horror, as it was not what he discovered, but it was what he didn't discover that made him stop dead in his tracks and slowly reach for the gun in his holster. It was a detail so minor that they had completely overlooked it on the last investigation of the husband's death. There was no phone upstairs. He suddenly heard a noise as he withdrew his gun and rushed out of the room, only to find an empty wheelchair atop the stairs. Pretty scary, huh? I really hope I edited that in some way that was actually entertaining, but yeah, I'm pretty sure you get why this would have scared me. This story is vivid enough that anytime I hear it, I always feel like I'm in that house. 
that I was investigating, and that as I went from room to room in this old house, I slowly realized that I was alone. Alone with something. Whatever that person really was. I honestly think I would have immediately jumped out of the window, crawled to my car, and driven away the second I heard that noise behind me. Like, I mean, look at this image associated with the creepypasta. Does this look like a person to you? This looks like when Plankton wore sandy skin as a suit. And yes, that is from a real SpongeBob episode, but that's not for today. Imagine a video recreation of this story, though. That would be horrific. I mean, hypothetically, I could probably do that. No, no, I shouldn't. But... This next one shouldn't be too much of a surprise to anyone who's familiar with the channel. I've been into Pokemon pretty much my entire life, and of course that means I got pretty heavily into Pokemon Creepypasta once I entered my Creepypasta phase. Lavender Town Syndrome, Pokemon Blue Tears, who remembers that one, Buried Alive, and of course, Pokemon Lost Silver. Lost Silver is super nostalgic to me. I can still remember when I first played the game. I'm pretty sure I discovered it because of Some Ordinary Gamers, which is basically who introduced me to Creepypasta in the first place. I don't even know how many Haunted Gaming episodes I watched over the years. It was a December day, or night, rather, and I was sitting in my kitchen using the family computer to play the game. Now let me see if I can kind of recreate my experience based on memory. I'm going to use an old archive of the game since this would have been 2013 when I first played this. I loaded into the game already knowing the story, I remember that much. I'm not sure if I watched a playthrough prior or not, but I definitely went through and checked all the usual stuff. Pokemon, badges, items, etc. Of course, spoiler alert, everything lined up perfectly with the original story. I remember immediately feeling mainly excited because I'd get to play a real creepypasta game for the first time. As I walked down the crimson red hallway, I remember being creeped out as it got darker and darker. Even if I had seen a playthrough in advance, I still felt this sense of anticipation. What would happen when I finally made it to the end? In the end, there was a single room with a sign. The sign tells you to turn back, and you're able to select yes or no. Selecting no will automatically direct you back to the yes option the first few times you click it, but if you're truly a persistent individual, you'll unlock a super silly, wacky, scary, secret ending. But don't worry about that right now though. I selected yes and was thrown into darkness, however, after looking through my unknown, I was able to see that I was in a graveyard. I wonder why that is. Any guessers? After enough time, I warped into the creepiest room in the game. A blood red sprout tower, completely silent. As you can see, Gold's ghost is albino. Great joke, moving on. All these ghosts staring at my character as I walked through made me feel a bit uncomfortable. I mean, who wouldn't? I'm the only one with red eyes, you know? The jokes are actually getting worse as time goes on. I don't, I don't even know if that's considered a joke. As I fight Ghost Red, the music immediately creeped me out. Well, before I was rendered completely deaf by the ear-splitting sound of Celebi's shine noise. After Celebi died, I walked around my in-game house as a ghost, checking things out as you do. Honestly, that would be a crazy fate, just being confined to your childhood home after you pass, especially if you can't play video games or anything. Nah, that would be insane work. I finally chose to end the game by going off screen and talking to my in-game self. My character's ghost life finally ends. R.I.P. Pretty creepy, pretty scary, but alright, I did say there was an alternate ending, so let's just get right into that, why don't we? So if you just ignore what the sign says like some heathen and continuously say no, you'll eventually end up on the hidden route. Now I'm going to tell the rest of this from a vague memory of my first person perspective. As I moonwalked up the hallway, I noticed that my character was somehow getting darker. Not really sure how that works, but maybe it represents the darkness consuming gold or something like that. After getting hit with a maze easy enough for my young mind to process, unlike those horrific Crystal Kaizo puzzles, I made it into Mount Silver. Gold was completely eyeless at this point, but thankfully they didn't turn this into a flash puzzle like Mount Moon. Mount Moon without flash was horrific. 
that was probably scarier than anything I mentioned in this video. Anyway, after enough walking, I was met with some weird type of text box. This box caused my starter to have zero name at all. Eventually, I got into another text box that claimed my starter was thrashing about. Honestly, if I was stuck inside of a Pokeball for the majority of my life, I would probably thrash around too. The world outside the cave creeped me out as it was completely grayscale. I could see my eyeless rival in an eyeless for alligator. Even creepier though, I was actually able to speak to the Pokemon and start a battle. Despite being level 90, I was able to defeat the Feraligator in one hit with my level 5 Cyndaquil. Very embarrassing for my rival. You gotta train harder man, even if you don't have eyes. After winning, I got transported to a grayscale version of Goldenrod City, and after talking to random gym leaders and getting scrambled unknown letters, I confusedly left the city. In the next purple version of Goldenrod, I found out that the letters spelled out, Who are you, kid? Pretty scary, huh? Obviously, I won't get into the deeper meaning of this game, because, you know, I was a child when I originally played it, but yeah, this is a nice touch. After leaving, I ended up going right back into the tower and following the original route, and that's really it. Honestly, Pokemon Creepypasta, and especially Pokemon Lost Silver, have a special place in my heart, man. Alright, so this next story is probably the most popular one on the list, and that would be the Lost Media Cult Classic, 1999. Now, I'm going to be honest, when I was younger, I did not feel like listening to anyone read this story. I remember thinking about it so many times before I actually took the time to just sit down for 45 minutes and pay attention to it. Not going to lie, I might be lucky that TikTok didn't exist during this time, or I would have had to play Subway servers while watching a sped up cooking compilation while I listened to it. Am I right, guys? Am I, am I, am I right? That's funny, right? All right. So anyway, how does this long story go and what stuck out to me since this is a creepypasta that actually scared me video? The story is all about this weird public access kids channel, Caledon Local 21, broadcasted from Caledon, Ontario. On the channel, the author finds several strange low budget kid shows, all hosted by a man called Mr. Bear. Mr. Bear is basically the bizarre world version of Bear from Bear in the Big Blue House. Goaded show, by the way. And of course, they made sure to make the image of him as creepy as possible. This guy just looks like he would not be allowed within 100 miles of human civilization. Like if I walked in the room and saw my kid watching a show hosted by this guy, I would immediately turn off the TV and move at least five cities over. That being said, after watching the channel for a while, we see the shows get weirder and weirder, with examples being Mr. Bear's Cellar, episode 23. This episode was entertaining for my friend and me, mainly because it had swearing. However, now when I think of the episode, I realize something was definitely wrong when it was filmed. The episode started with the camera on its side, while it was facing Mr. Bear, who was walking upstairs to the cellar door. The camera then blacked out for a second before fading in, back upright, and facing Mr. Bear. There was also another kid talking to him, but this kid looked about 11 or 12. He was talking to Mr. Bear for a while, but I couldn't hear well, again with the crappy camcorder, until the kid started raising his voice. The kid was saying how it was late and his sister had to go home, and you could also hear more voices in the background. I remember Mr. Bear clearly saying, Get the out. You're not invited. With a deep voice muffled by the bear mask. I remember my friend and I looking at each other and laughing at the mention of the forbidden F word, but the episode got weirder. The kid began climbing the stairs before turning around and saying how he was going to call the police. Mr. Bear began breaking out in a run towards the kid, who started screaming and running as well. The camera then cut out, and that was the end of the episode. The channel then turned into static shortly after. As someone that used to be afraid of goosebumps as a child, I can't even imagine the irreparable damage seeing that would have done to my psyche. Somehow things get even weirder though. A month later, the author would check the channel one more time, where they would see an episode where Mr. Bear was asking kids to write him letters if they wanted to visit his cellar. Very normal behavior, of course. For some strange reason, the author actually decides to send Mr. Bear a letter, and they get this, this response. Dear Elliot, Thank you ever so much for your letter. I would love to have you in my cellar. We play games, watch movies, and go fire camping in the middle of the woods. Come to my house at Caledon, Ontario, Canada. I look very forward to having fun with you. Love, Mr. Bear. So, of course, after getting that not at all creepy letter, what does our author do? Well, they ask their dad 
who hasn't seen any of the show by the way, to actually go see Mr. Bear. The dad actually takes him, because again, I think he thinks this is some type of legitimate show or something. I'd still be pretty apprehensive about letting my kid hang out with some random stranger. Either way, they pull up to the house, which is a horrific looking old dilapidated farmhouse, and out of the door comes a police officer who proceeds to talk to the author's father. Long story short, this guy, Mr. Bear, kidnapped these kids and held them in his basement. But that's not all. Apparently, he was obsessed with a bunch of cult stuff and was sacrificing these kids in a massive cult ritual. Very insane stuff, and that's only the beginning of this story. There's so much other absurd stuff about the man behind Mr. Bear, like for example, the other two shows that aired on Kaladin Local 21. I know other people watched it for sure, including those kids who wound up at Mr. Bear's house. After some Google searches, I found a few people on the Neo Seeker forums who were discussing shows from Kaladin Local 21. They talked about the two shows I watched, but also another two shows I had never seen before. A user named I Am Real Life seemed to know all the shows that were broadcasted on Channel 21, and here are two I've never heard of. The Fallen Angel and Life I Am Real Life described that as a fairly boring show about a guy rambling on and on in front of a camera about how he must please Satan and appease him before it's too late. Paint with the soul. I Am Real Life and another user called Siggy92 were discussing this show. They described it as Blair Witch-like, as it consisted of the cameraman wandering around a forest at night, doing nothing particularly interesting. This story is genuinely so insane. I can't imagine how crazy it would be if this guy was real, and if people were able to see this unfold in real time. But who knows? Maybe some guy will host some weird page on YouTube and try the same thing. Hopefully not though, for everyone's sake. To avoid making this segment 30 minutes, I'm going to leave things off with the last message Mr. Bear leaves the author of our story. Once upon a time, there lived a boy named Elliot. Elliot was a clever boy who loved playing with his friends. One day, he watched a lovely television show about a bear and his children friends. The children loved helping each other, as good children should, but they also loved the bear. The bear loved the children, since the children were so good at helping him and the fallen angel. The children and the bear wanted to play together forever with the help of their angel friend. But the fallen angel needed even more help, so the children had to give the ultimate sacrifice. Because that's what friends do, Elliot. They help each other. Help us, Elliot. Burn with us, Elliot. I want you, Elliot. He wants you, Elliot. Come back to my cellar. Pretty please, with sugar and icing on top. Mr. Bear. For once, I'm actually glad I ended up taking drastically too long to upload a video because I have some great visuals to go along with this creepypasta thanks to Vibing Lee's remake of it. What creepypasta is that, you ask? Mr. Mix. I never really hear anyone covering the story whenever they reflect upon creepypasta they remember, but this one stuck with me. Honestly, looking back, it is a little cheesy. Just a little, but let's get into it. The story is about a typing game from the 90s called Mr. Mix, wherein you'd put ingredients into a bowl by typing in the names of said ingredients. The game also gets drastically harder each level, with the first being very easy and the third being around 85 words per minute. Unfortunately, since Vibing Leaf made a playable remake of Mr. Mix as well, I had to find that out the hard way, but we'll get to that later. The first noticeable thing about the game was this really weird music. You'll also be able to hear this in Vibing Leaf's remake as well. Level 1 has this strange pattern of growls, and uh, by the way, when you see me playing this game, I had some like old mic settings and they weren't very good because I got a new mic, and anyway, it sounds kind of bad, but just pay attention to me playing, just try to ignore that, because there's some like high pitch noise, anyway, I fixed it obviously, you can tell by my current mic, but you know, because I fixed the settings, but anyway, anyway. Oh boy, it's my, it's my favorite game, Mr. Mix, I love this game, dude. Oh man, how am I even gonna be able to type? I got a weird setup going on right now. Okay. What? I'm cooking. Oh, I'm cooking. Oh, I'm cooking. I love this music, dude. It's so homely. I feel like I'm in a I feel like I'm in a comforting kitchen right now. You know what I mean? This is this is awesome. As you can see, even in the remix, Mr. Mix has a bit of a 
creepy appearance, but in the original, his appearance is even more unnerving. It's said in the story that children who played the game would have nightmares about Mr. Mix speaking to them in a raspy voice, telling them to keep quiet about something. Personally, as a child, I think I'd be having nightmares about playing level 3 over and over, but that's just me. That level cooked me so bad. Anyway, back to the story. Level 2 has a low quality hairdryer noise playing in the background in the story, but in the remix, the game was silent. Mr. Mix, I like Mr. Mix's goat eyes. You know, he's got those goat pupils. What? What? A R T I C H O K E. What? Don't piss me off. I almost just spelled it wrong. Listen, I played enough. I played enough Nitro Type, okay, dude? I've played enough Nitro Type. Real Nitro Type enjoyers, they know, dude. That's not stopping me. Level 3 also has a pretty disturbing track itself, but unfortunately for me, the difficulty spike was much worse than any of the music. Alright, next game. Next game. Let's do it. Oh, I just spelled that wrong. That's embarrassing. I just spelled that wrong too! What is it? What even is that? Astragalus? Astragalus. Oh, I forgot the R. Oh, I'm so, I'm so teed up right now. I can't even give good commentary. But anyway, honestly, honestly, this game, it's a great game. I love the music. That is not how you spell that, is it? Listen, I'm a YouTuber, not a scholar, dude. I honestly don't know. What? Hello? Thank you. What? Oh, I feel like I'm inside of the blender right now. Edder, Edder! Hello? What? What? Why is it not working? Okay, okay, okay. What? Bro, I'm I'm cooking so bad I can't even like I can't even I can't even pay attention to anything around me. Like the entire world has disappeared. Just me and Mr. Mix right now. I'm so tapped in. What happened? What? How? Oh my. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I can't spell for the life of me. I'm so finished, bro. Oh my God. Ah! No! I was so close! Ag! Ah! Uh. Ha! Ah. Yes! I did it, dude! Let's go! I'm not beating the next level. It's impossible. I also gave level 4 a try, unfortunately. It's impossible. It's impossible. I'm gonna try. It's impossible though. It's impossible. It's impossible.
What? Why? What happened? Oh my god. Ah! Oh! Rock. I'm finished. There's no way. Bro. Oh my god. Oh, I almost- I almost fumbled the whole thing. I almost fumbled the whole thing. I almost fumbled the whole thing. Oh, my elbows hurt so bad. No, dude, I can't do it. Because of the difficulty spikes, the game was basically impossible from level 5 onward. But I'm gonna do it anyway. Who's that? Oh, what? Are you... I can't do that! 300?! Oh my god. Thank God this game was made for a little illiterate people like me. Those three hundred. Do I have to go until the time's up? How's that game over? I beat the score. I beat the score, dude. What was the point, dude? I beat the whole thing! Luckily, in this story, hackers managed to get into the game's files and bypass said fifth level. Upon doing so, the game would crash and a ton of disturbing image files would be written into the computer system 32. This was caused by a lone byte in the game somehow, and when that was removed, the hackers were able to go on to the sixth level. This level was apparently so disturbing that none of the hackers would dare tell anyone what exactly it was that they saw. As a kid, this was pretty unnerving to me because of the power of imagination and all that. But as an adult, it's kind of like, what could have been that bad, you know? I mean, there are some truly horrific games out there. Somehow, whatever was in this last level was so crazy that these guys developed symptoms of PTSD and became mute within a week, with all of them going missing within a month. Obviously, they destroyed all of the games after this, as you would. Two years later, though, a guy dressed like a chef tries to kidnap a little girl from a grocery store, and when he was interrogated, all he would say was, I am Mr. Mix. Shh. This is pretty unnerving at first, but then I think about it from an interrogation perspective, like, hold on, hold on, let me do the skin. Hey sir, how are you doing today? I'm Detective, uh, 
I don't know, Jones, and this is Detective Sampson. So do you want to tell us what happened today? I am Mr. Mix. Shh. I see. Is Mr. Mix some sort of character? I am Mr. Mix. Shh. Eventually. Okay, for the 200th time, did you or did you not visit this store today, and is this not you on the security footage? I am Mr. Mix. Shh. All right, I'm retiring. Next story is probably the most obscure in this entire video. It's called Never Stop Running. Now, full disclosure, this is probably also the cheesiest story ever, but when I was young, it kind of creeped me out. I remember some ordinary gamers reading it, but that was so long ago that I had to read it again myself. Long story short, this guy is in college, and because he can't bring any of his game systems to school, he downloads ZSNES, an SNES emulator, and gets a Super Mario World zip file that's full of ROM hacks for some reason? Never happened to me, but anyway, this guy tries out all the hacks until he finds one called Run. Upon finding this, he says, and I quote, Creeped out. I deleted it immediately. I had recently heard the story about Sonic EXE, and I couldn't get that Kafka sound effect out of my head. I was not taking any chances. Like I said before, forget I ever mentioned these stories. As hilarious as this quote is, to be fair, there was a point in time where Sonic EXE was legitimately scary to a lot of people. Either way, somehow, the game is mysteriously back on his PC a couple hours later, and like anyone who's apparently terrified of a creepypasta game, he decides to play it. The whole game is normal until he gets to the end where he plays a completely empty level. When he finally stumbles upon a text box, it tells him that he must run or die. This sends a shiver down his spine. Probably would have set one down mine too, but that's just because I would have expected it to be a really difficult side-scrolling level. Either way, for our narrator, that's exactly the case, with the level slowly getting faster and faster. He gets through the whole level, which is much longer than a normal one, but upon reaching the end and going through the gate, Mario stops as usual. Usually in a normal hack after this, he would be invincible, I think. I could be wrong, but I think he'd be fine. However, in this game, Mario gets crushed, and it's very gross and graphic sounding. This causes our narrator to close the game, and somehow every single file in his iTunes and on his PC got replaced with a file called You Stopped Running, which, when you think about it, is kind of crazy because he actually beat the level. I mean, what else could he have done? Despite all his files being destroyed because of this, he just moves on from the incident within a week. That is, until one day while working on his homework, he hears something hit his window and a car speeds off. Somehow, the crack in the window perfectly spells run in Russian, which of course our narrator has been studying. However, whoever created that crack may be in the wrong line of work because that's actually pretty impressive. Regardless, the narrator then goes to pet his roommate's dog, and literally instantly after shutting the door, he hears a noise in the room. He goes back to check and the dog is deceased, with the Russian word for run colored into its fur. This whole thing, of course, causes him to become very confused and stressed. He comes to the conclusion that he may cause people to die like that dog, so he decides to uh, move on from life. In the epilogue, we're at the guy's funeral where a bunch of people come, and then when visiting his building, they see what looks to be the same dog mentioned in the story being walked. It's also odd because the old narrator's brother checks the old PC and can't find the zip file or any of those strange files on the PC at all, so was this just some kind of psychotic break or did the game mysteriously remove any trace of itself existing? And also, why wouldn't they just buy a similar dog to replace the old one? Like, why does it have to be the same exact dog? Anyway, I don't know. This story is just kind of silly and I wanted to talk about it. 